Hi, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the Oxford Economy Society's second week of the term. Uh, my name is Andy, as usual. I'm the events director of the Oxford Economy Society uh, and a master's student studying environmental change and management. Uh, for those of us who are joining OCS for the first time, uh, I'll just give a really brief introduction to who we are and what we do. Uh, essentially, we're a student society at Oxford University, and we aim to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. We do that through weekly speaker events. Uh, we also have uh, an educational program called the School of Climate Change, which teaches around over 1,500 people from across the world. Uh, we also run grassroots action campaigns uh, and work closely with the university to develop net zero policies and really incorporate climate into all of the colleges and all the curriculums. You can find out a little bit more about the work that we do on our website, as well as our Facebook page. Uh, but today's event centers on climate anxieties, and we're really, really excited to be welcoming uh, Dr. Sarah Ray to be discussing all this with us. Dr. Sarah Ray is a professor and the chair of environmental studies at Humboldt State University. Uh, in addition to that, she teaches and researches the environmental humanities, uh, environmental justice, emotions and education, and uh, obviously climate anxieties as well. She did her PhD at the University of Oregon uh, and studied environmental sciences, studies, and policy, and received an MA in American studies uh, at UT Austin, as well as a BA in religious studies and women's studies at Swarthmore College. She's the author of A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. So I'll just pass it on over to you, Dr. Ray, to start us off. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks for everyone for tuning in and to Oxford Climate Society for thinking to even talk about this topic and invite me to see what I can offer you all uh, some insight on it. Um, my understanding is I'll talk for just a short, do a real short talk, kind of introduce you to why I got into this topic and uh, what I think are some key, most key take home points and then just open for discussion. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all too. So I suppose the best way to get started is to talk about a little bit about why I got into this topic in the first place. Um, I, my background was in environmental justice, environmental justice literary criticism or eco-criticism, and also what at that time hadn't had a name yet, but would, would become the environmental humanities. And I was really trying to figure out how to bring justice questions more centered to environmental work and environmental theory and environmental um, thinking. And so the, my first book was based on that topic. It's called the Ecological Other about, it's called subtitles, Environmental Exclusion in American Culture. And what I was interested in there was how the emotion of disgust registers in the environmental movement in ways that makes it easy to naturalize racism or that sort of thing. And so I'm thinking here about the exclusion of native peoples from their indigenous lands to create spaces for the National Park Service. In the 19th century, the progressive era anti-immigration laws that prevented, um, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act and various different immigration laws that happened often in the name of uh, protecting the environment or protecting resources. And so um, even anti-litter campaigns oftentimes are code for uh, sort of racist uh, actions. And we see this happening also again and it has eco-fascism mounts in things like climate anxiety, which I write about in the Scientific American Climate anxiety is an overwhelmingly white phenomenon, which I'll drop in the chat in a second. Um, but there's there's a, a trend also happening now where the emotion, not just of disgust, but anxiety even, is uh, prompting some pretty xenophobic and even um, violent, deadly actions like the 2019 uh, Christchurch and El Paso shootings, which cited climate change explicitly as a reason for that kind of violence. And so how does uh, climate anxiety or emotional environmental emotions get wrapped up into different ways that people feel about each other and organize themselves and even around policies of exclusion? Those are things that are always that I was very interested in. But it wasn't until um, my students in my classes about six or so years ago weren't, um, it, the content of what we were learning around environmental justice and also climate change, climate change was sort of becoming the big story in environmental studies classes. Things started to feel more urgent, um, the sort of intellectual exercise of questioning the wilderness myth or that kind of thing started to seem um, almost not, there wasn't sort of space for that as much anymore. And students seem to be coming to class already pretty informed about how bad things were. And um, the kind of traditional model of environmental education that I had been taught through my PhD 
which was to get students to care more about stuff and then maybe engage in more pro-environmental behavior, um, that that was no longer really working. Students already came in to the classroom pretty concerned and didn't have the emotional or existential skill set to deal with how bad the information was that was being dumped on them in their environmental classes. And it was sort of backfiring. The bad news and the intensity of professors trained in this old model, just firing like a fire hose, all of this bad information at them was starting to make students despair, is starting to make students feel hopeless. Um, not having enough information about how to solve the problems or what to do with the despair that they were feeling was leaving them sort of wondering what they were doing in the field and maybe they should just give up. And so I thought, well, we're not going to have these students coming out of these programs are not going to have the capacity to engage in these issues. In fact, they might not even keep staying in the major or even in, in any of these environmental fields, they might just check out um, and not just not become the amazing climate warriors that we want them to be but also maybe not even stay in the major or much less graduate or get up in the morning and come to class. So I was getting um, my finger on the pulse of students' emotional response to this material about halfway through my career. And I realized that I needed to shift my research focus to the question of um, what is the emotional skills or tools that we need to teach students or that they will need from us or from somewhere when they go out and do this climate work and in service of climate justice, because obviously big environmental emotions can lead to some pretty terrible stuff too. How can we channel the despair or channel the, the sense of uh, powerlessness into something else? And what, what did I as an environmental humanist with a justice oriented bent have to offer to these students in this, what felt like a new historical moment of, of bad news. Um, and so, uh, that question has been driving my research since then. Um, and I had a dear friend at, at a conference tell me, well, I was complaining to her that I couldn't do my research because I was so busy acting like a therapist to my students trying to get through this material. And we were all sharing these stories about our students just being really despairing. And the mental, I started researching the mental health profile of college age students and realizing that this wasn't just a one-off situation in my classroom. This was a a chronic issue across the country. And I was sort of wondering why nobody was thinking about mental health and climate together in among these students. And I wanted to research that. And since then, things have changed a lot. Um, I'll, I wanna drop in the chat a couple of things. In 2021, this became really, um, I know there's nobody here, and I don't know if you can put this on YouTube, Andy, but um, help me out with the links. Um, in 2021, there was a huge, uh, um, public, uh, a study published that was uh, a survey of over 10,000 young people across the world, not just in northern countries, not just in America, um, across the world, that showed the prevalence of climate anxiety among youth in particular. And so the story of climate or, or climate injustice and the emotional lives of young people has been growing a lot of attention and a lot of people are focusing their energies on it. Um, and it was, my students were sort of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, that by the time I was about ready to publish a field guide to climate anxiety, that's when the youth climate movement really kicked off um, with the catalyzing moment of Greta Thunberg. And you know that, that youth climate movement that happened there for, for about two years, and it's still going, but that really kicked off and had the largest youth movement, youth march that we've ever seen. Um, I could have seen that coming a mile away. And I was so gratified to see youth that, that this wasn't just my students. This was youth across the world, really uh, having this intense emotional response to the state of the planet that they were being handed. And uh, I really found it to, to be a sense of purpose in my own research and work with young people or with students, that this could be really something that, that educators could have a new role in this new moment that we didn't have to be therapists, but if we centered emotional intelligence and practices of wisdom and studying other social movements and wisdom traditions that have gone through difficult times and figured out how to have the kind of uh, sense of efficacy within a community or collective, that the stories that we lived in, that all kinds of things that we could do to cultivate the kinds of existential tools that we all need, 
um, to do this work and to do it for our lives. And so um, that became kind of my, my mission. Um, and while I'm here in the, in the chat, I'll also throw in my Scientific American piece about um, environmental racism and climate anxiety. And um, if people are interested, my most recent piece is about who feels climate anxiety, because I think one of the things that happens that, that in the big flurry of attention around climate anxiety is that there's a lot of focus on um, climate anxiety as a mental health question and a pathologizing question that really is uh, the attention getting, the resources that are getting harnessed for it is sort of going to the privileged. And there's not very much attention being paid to how it is that different, depending on your positionality, you might experience climate climate change and with a wider array of emotions than just anxiety or how anxiety might be a catch-all term for a lot of different nuances. It's not a universal thing. Um, just because you're experiencing climate change doesn't mean you're going to have the same feelings. It, it really depends on how people experience climate change and how um, different emotions mean different things in different cultural contexts. Um, as we know, depending on language even, different cultures can have different um, emotions for different things. And one of the things that's uh, a real indicator of, um, some people are arguing, like Glenn Albrecht is arguing that a real indicator for our lack of emotional behavior in American society is a lack of vocabulary around emotions that relate to the natural world. So as an example of that, I hope that you enjoy that piece. Um, so, that's a little bit about my story about, about that. Um, the problem, of course, is become, becomes that um, most of the pushback that I get from um, students and teachers, students tend to sometimes feel like the, the work on the emotional toolkit is a waste of time, and they really want to get their sleeves rolled up and just get out there. Their despair is driving them to almost impulsive action. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time working on with students and writing about is the need to slow down a little bit. The, the urgency of the moment of climate change makes us feel like we gotta just get in there and do anything. But that kind of impulsive reactivity uh, without any kind of strategy or vision or direction or, or a sense of a collective can actually really burn people out. And I've seen that so often happen in my students, this kind of frenetic desire to act uh, and results in burnout and even further despair. And so uh, I spent a lot of time in my book arguing about how, just trying to make a case for why not to do that um, and what are some alternatives and how we might strategically avoid that particular problem of urgency plus despair leading to a kind of negative feedback loop on that. And so my critique of urgency is something that I'm sort of building a little bit more and further work I'm doing. Of course, we're in an urgent situation. Of course, we need to be acting. Um, but I really uh, try to include in action all of the slowing down, rest, sleep, um, not so much self-care in the sense of the neoliberalization of healthcare, but the self-care and the Audre Lorde version of it, where you think of making sure that you are full of resources, uh, all the resources that you need in, in, in your interior life, so that you can show up for the causes that you care about the most. Um, it's, there is a real dialect, dialectical relationship between um, climate action and interior resourcefulness that we all need. And I think the myth of the individual that's so prevalent in American culture and capitalist culture uh, really makes us um, think that we just are only valuable for contributing, contributing, acting, acting, producing, producing, and that that's true even in, the act in activist circles and that we need to really resist that. And I'm really thinking of the great work of Tricia Hersey here. I'm loving her work in the NAP ministry, if anyone's interested in looking that citation up. Um, she really politicizes and historically contextualizes the need for rest within social movements. And I'm starting to think a lot about that. Um, so one of the things that happened in my research as I turned to this work is that I started thinking about what's the, what is the science of emotions? What does it say about which emotions are the most useful for long-term engagement in something like a social movement or climate action? And that might be a flawed question in lots of ways, but um, the, the investigation has been really interesting. One of the things that that resulted in is realizing that guilt is not an effective emotion for long-term engagement, and I won't get into all those reasons why, but I found that really interesting. And that things like the pseudo-inefficacy effect or negativity bias were really important, powerful psychological uh, tricks that we're playing on ourselves by consuming the kind of media that we do, by living in certain stories. Uh, the pseudo inefficacy effect is basically this concept that if we don't believe that we can make a difference in a particular problem, we're not even likely to even try to. 
And with the size of the scale of the problem of climate change and our perceived scale of our own ability to make a difference in, the, in that hugeness of the problem, it, what it happens in that, that, that chasm between the scales of our small little selves and the bigness of climate change is that we don't even try. And so this creates uh, a real um, internal uh, conflict for the climate movement that if we think ourselves too small and we think of the problem as too big, we won't even wanna engage in it at all. And so this is something I've been trying to challenge in a lot of my work. Um, you all probably know what the negativity bias is, um, but this is our inability to see the positive things that are happening and our, our overemphasis and our reptilian brains on things that are threatening in our, in our immediate horizon. And this negativity bias, as we've seen in things like uh, Don't Look Up or other kinds of representations of climate change, climate change is a really difficult threat to narrate as something that's really in our faces to trigger the amygdala and make us think about it. Um, and so the, this has been a, the, the challenge of thinking of the neuroscience of emotions and how to, how to tell the story of climate change versus other kinds of threats that are in people's lives has all, always been interesting to me, an important set of psychological tools to bring to this. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just stop there because I could talk forever and I think that that's my 20 minutes or 15 minutes or so and I, I just want to, that was just a bunch of stuff to tell you my story and uh, give you some of the ideas that have got me thinking and puzzling through some of these problems myself. We can open up for Q&A or discussion or whatever, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. There was a lot of really important things that you touched upon that I think uh, deserve unpacking. So I'm just going to dive right on into one of them, which is uh, what you talked about about channeling despair. Uh, so you write in your book that instead of motivating ourselves with eco guilt, uh, that we should really be harnessing uh, love and reverence and pleasure, which are the emotions that generate long-term commitment uh, and to really reframe anxiety, reframe grief and despair uh, in, in terms of love and desire and compassion. And so I just wanna ask you uh, what that might look like in practice and what uh, a few examples of ways in which people and, and students and really of all ages can reframe negative feelings into positive ones. Thanks so much, Andy. I love that question. That's one of my favorite um, things I discovered in the research to give myself a different approach to my own life. So um, there's a section of the book that probably comes from that's called Less Stick, More Carrot. And um, this is, comes from the insights from psychology that seem really obvious, but we don't really practice in our lives, which is that positive dopamine hits make us want to do things more and, and getting patted on the head and positive reinforcement or in parenting, what's called strength-based parenting. And they have all kinds of, um, depending on what field you're in, there's different language for it. But it's this notion that human beings psychologically are attracted to positive, to, to comfortable feelings, to dopamine hits and oxytocin and all kinds of those hormones that flow through our bodies. We want more of them. So we go back and to the places that give it to us. And envir the environmental movement for, for a long time has been really a movement of, um, of guilt and deprivation and sacrifice. The politics of, of uh, renunciation have been really big in environmentalism. And I actually love that about the environmental movement as a sort of lay Buddhist type myself. <laughs> I kind of appreciate that. And I, I pursue that in lots of ways that I can, although I, I have as, as much desire and graspiness as the next person, but there's a sense of the environmental movement maybe having failed to attract the kind of um, energy that it might have been able to do because of the sort of depressing qualities of what it's teaching and its approach and what it seems to be asking of people to do, which is to give up stuff that seems pleasurable in a capitalist society. And um, I think one of the things that the climate movement has really is really on the brink of doing and hasn't really done is to reframe all of those sacrifices and all of those changes and all of those upsets to normality that even COVID has asked us to do, many of us, I think that if one could reframe them in a, as a narrative of how much people are gaining when we make those changes, when we have those huge lifestyle changes, if we move away from fossil fuels, all the wonderful things that we might gain from that, what kind of utopia we could live in, what kinds of new relationships with other people in the more than human world, and just all the things we could gain and how rich life could be, the reframe around abundance rather than scarcity or the reframe around, um, you know, all of the, you know, um, 
all the stuff that we would gain rather than what we'd have to give up is one of the things I think the climate movement needs to do more work on because rather than focusing on here's the apocalypse, here's how bad things could be, here are all the bad examples of how bad things could be in this assumption that the psychological effect is going to be that people are going to get, get motivated to do stuff is a false, is false. It turns out psychologically that doesn't get people motivated to do stuff. Um, in fact, no wonder people are in so much denial, even, and, and really the better word for it is less denial than cognitive dissonance, that people know the problem's really bad, but just don't know what to do about it and don't, don't really want to give up anything. And so we're stuck. We're stuck at this impasse of no one really wants to give up anything. No one really wants, knows what to do about it. There's a sort of swath of the majority of the you know, first worlders who are in that position. And if the climate movement could, ad could address that population of people who have a significant amount of power to make a difference, um, that this is actually a lot of gain, right? I mean, I love that poem that was read um, after the 2016 US presidential election by Val Valerie Carr that says something like, we're in a womb and not a tomb. And that particular reframe of what kind of story we're living in, Joanna Macy refers to the great turning rather than the great unraveling. We're about to be on the precipice of this thing that's about to be born, that's beautiful and wonderful, about to manifest this world, this post fossil fuel world that we all want. That is a very, and it makes people wanna get up in the morning and do something rather than the world is all going to, you know, wear in a hand, hand basket. And so what's the point? And um, yeah, pleasure, community, joy, uh, humor. Uh, it, these all trigger those emotions that make you want to come back for more <laughs> instead of say, oh, this, this horrible state of the world, the horrible state of things just makes me want to dive into some kind of numbing strategy. And that usually involves harming the planet even more, you know, swiping or buying more stuff or various forms of distraction that we use to um, numb the way that this makes us feel. So yeah, can we, can we feel good about this work in some way? Um, there's a wonderful Greek word called, that's called eudaimonia, which is a sense of fulfill, fulfillment and sense of purpose that we have when we're part of something that's collective and, and making a difference. And um, this is a very a preferred alternative for me than uh, this capitalist notion of happiness uh, through acquisition. Yeah, and, and you know, you mentioned Don't Look Up, and so uh, that's a film that really doesn't sugarcoat, you know, the message that it has with regards to the climate crisis, and it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't mince any words in, in how it reframes, or I guess doesn't reframe grief and despair and anxiety, and so I'm wondering, do you think that films like that, that just kind of tell it like it is, uh, maybe don't really uh, frame it in terms of love and desire and compassion, uh, that the consumption of those types of media are actually not really beneficial for climate anxieties? Or, you know, what is your opinion on, on films like that and on media like that and how we should be uh, going about engaging with that? That's such a great question. And I don't think I have a, a, I'm not totally decided yet on my answer to that. So I'm open to having my, my view change on that. So if anybody, you know, if there's anybody who would like to have a different opinion, I'd love to hear it. Um, my instinct was that that was a great film. I loved it for so many reasons. It solved a lot of the puzzles that climate communicators and climate science communicators have been struggling with for some time. And I think it's in that sense, quite genius. And there's other aspects, other cultural criticism that's going on in the film, not even related to climate, but that are related to climate that I think are really, really valuable. Um, so I, I don't wanna throw the baby out the bathwater. I think the film was uh, very effective on lots of levels. Um, the one place that it might not be is exactly on the point you made, Andy, which is that, you know, if it's true that the average American is, can more likely imagine the apocalypse than they can a post-fossil fuel society, which is what Kari Norgaard has discovered in her work, she's an environmental sociologist, then we are really screwed, right? Because the imagination, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. I mean, if we don't think that there's such a thing as a post fossil fuel society that is something that human beings can manifest, can create, then we are more likely to just throw our hands up and wait for the apocalypse. And so any kind of apocalyptic narrative, any time climate change is framed in an apocalyptic doom and gloom way, I think it's dangerous. Right. Because it just it, it, it circumscribes our ability to imagine some alternative. And 
what would a film be that that articulated out a just transition and made that irresistible? I don't, I mean, that, that I would really like to see that film, <laughs> but that won't make media, right? That won't, that, you know, you have the do the negativity bias accounts for why they did that and um, why it is that people pay so much attention to apocalypse. And there's just, there's not a whole, within those, that, that framework, you can't have a blockbuster that doesn't do something like that, unfortunately. And so why you might as well sneak in all this other great criticism, which they did do. So I appreciate that. Um, the con the psychological concept of the availability heuristic means that people uh, they refer back to or they they attach to something that they've most recently seen or an image that's stuck in their mind as a uh, reference point for truth for them to move forward. And so we're more likely to uh, believe something we've seen recently on TV or images that stick in our mind. The stuff that we hear the most or the most recently is likely to dictate our sense of what is true. And so we're not at all rational creatures. You know, we do not actually weigh, you know, actual risk probability when we make decisions. We think about the most recent movie and that's how we decide what to be afraid of, you know. And so sadly, that means that the more we see apocalypse, the more we believe it to be true, which then creates the reality of it. Yeah, there's always that tension between what people kind of need to hear and what sells. And so I think that's really uh, a good point. Um, yeah. But another thing that you you just talked about and you wrote about in your book, as well is that it's OK to be selfish and that putting yourself first can actually help to avoid some burnout and make you a better advocate for climate justice. And mm -hmm. so I want to ask you, you know, what does it look like to be selfish in a positive way and how how can we really take steps to shift away from this mindset that we have to be constantly working towards a greener future and constantly be uh, taking steps in that direct pursuit? Great. Um, okay, so that is a tough question. And, and um, you're, you're speaking to a, a mom here. So I, I fully, I fully, uh, I have fully drunk the Kool-Aid that being selfish is truly bad. So I, I, I'm gonna just, I'm going to answer that question and try not to even use that word. <laughs> you don't mind. Um, because I'd like to reframe it. I'd like to dig it out of the shadows. I'd like to um, give it a positive spin. I, I'd like it to mean something different in our culture than that word means. Um, this, this, the sum to it is this. If we care about a cause, let's say climate change, just for example, if we care about a cause, the cause is not going to get anywhere when we burn out. And at some point, the cost of that chronic stress or acute stress, depending on how, what kind of you know, traumas we're living in, acute or, trauma, or acute or chronic trauma and stress, which is what we're living in, um, has health and mental, physical and mental health costs to our bodies and our minds. And at some point, this is not like a sign of weakness of our own, of our weakness, but this is just a medical fact. Our bodies can't sustain that kind of stress for a long time. But the movement, the cause, does need our energy for a long time. And so we can either decide to give it 100 for 50 percent for a year or two, or we can give it 90 percent for our whole lifetimes. I mean, that's just a, that's just like figures pulled out of my out of the air, but just to make the point that the planet kind of needs us to be doing this for our lives. This is not just gonna be like, we work really hard into the night, burn the midnight oil. And then in a year or two, we're gonna wake up and the utopia will be achieved and the causes will no longer be there to even be part of. And, oh, we can rest and now we can enjoy things and not, and, and then we can be selfish, right? Or then we can be, you know, we can rest. We're never gonna rest. This stuff is gonna be around us our whole lives. This is gonna be a problem we fight for our lives. So if that's true, and we really care about this thing, we will pre preserve, preserve ourselves to show up for this work. And so that's, that's, what I, that's what I mean. And I didn't really get that until I actually had kids. I mean, I don't think everyone, you don't think you have to have kids to get this, on the contrary. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that at all. But it was like, oh yeah, the amount of sleeplessness that I'm experiencing is turning me into a terrible human being. And that's actually doing more harm to my kids than the good I'm possibly giving them by staying awake for them and constantly being present for them. 
So you, so that real clear illustration of my own life, I hope is clear to anybody who's experienced climate burnout, because the, the work we want to do on climate change is going to be lifelong. It's a marathon, not a sprint, as Robert Bullard puts it. So if this work is a marathon, not a sprint, and in fact, if we do have limitations to the output we can give, what does that mean for us? You know, and the other point of this that I think people don't talk about very much is that the myth of the individual in American society, in Western society, uh, really prioritizes the individuals. So we think we're the only ones out there doing this hard work. And that makes us burn it even harder, right? Like, like if I don't do this, if I'm not the one showing up for this, it's never gonna get done. I gotta do it. I gotta be there. I gotta show up. I gotta do this work, gotta do that. The capitalist productivist imaginary that's so embedded in that individualism is part of our activism too. It's part of our, my job. I mean, I feel like my, my current career as a professor tells me that that's how I have to give to it, right? And that martyring of ourselves will result in us having to check out of, check out of stuff. And we, we will not physically be around, mentally or physically be around to do the work for as long as we could be. If we, if we made sure we were constantly re resourced to do it. And if we're in a collective, it's like the metaphor of the choir. If we're in a huge choir singing some great piece, then when we need to take a breath, we can rest assured that the music is gonna continue and it won't make a huge amount of dent in the effort. Um, so we need to take that breath. We need to take that pause so that we can be, come back to the, to the song, you know? Yeah, just two questions about the myth of the individual. Uh, so there seems to be sort of a paradox almost between uh, that eth ethos of individualism and also this growing sentiment that uh, it's corporations that are responsible for the vast majority of global emissions and that we as individuals uh, shouldn't really be expected to, to make personal changes in our lives. Uh, it's not going to make that much of a difference because of the fact that it is uh, corporations that are emitting the vast majority of, of global emissions. And so is that the wrong attitude to have with respect to ameliorating climate anxieties uh, to kind of push away uh, the re recognition that small actions can actually have larger results? Or how do we- Andy, you're asking the, the, the million dollar question, right? Um, <laughs> that's such a great question. And, I, and my response to that question has been that I really think we need to call for a massive reframe of that question, that it's really not either or. And here I'm drawing on Mary Annalise Heglar's work. I really think Mary Annalise Heglar is uh, one of the most brilliant voices of our moment. And in several podcasts and different places, she's actually said, we've, we went from believing what BP wanted us to believe, which was that the individual stuff mattered, right? I mean, we all saw an inconvenient truth and at the end of the inconvenient truth and all like that early era of environmental documentaries always had some little thing you could do, text, such and such to save the dolphins or whatever, right? And change your light bulb, whatever. And so we believed the myth that it was the individual that could make a difference. And then we became, we all swung that direction of lifestyle change, right? Individual lifestyle change. And I won't detail all the problems with that approach, but the result has been that most people have come around to thinking that that's just a drop in the bucket, what they call the drop in the bucket imaginary that it doesn't make any difference if I don't use this plastic straw right now, so what's the point? So, you know, corporations are so all powerful and they're doing so much and they've infiltrated all levels of politics and the fossil fuel, you know, um, industry is, is, is like this monolith, right? And my little self can't do anything in that. And so that, that swing to the other direction of, of thinking of, of corporates, corporations and structures and politics as all powerful and the individual is having no power, has been also damaging. Um, that's clearly not true. And there are lots of different people who are coming up with really beautiful uh, solutions to that binary. And I won't detail them all right now. I'm not the only person thinking about this. Everybody's thinking about this. But lots of people have come up with lots of different ways, ways out of that tension. That's not, it, that come down to the punchline of, that's, it's not either or, it's not black and white like that. And there is, um, I mean, just for example, you only need a certain amount of a population to care about something for a significant social change to be catalyzed. Um, if you think about Rebecca Solnit's work and thinking about how it is that it's never just one individual, it's this sort of activism is a dive into the deep, it's not a chess game, you never know how it's gonna come out and you have to find some reason to 
do the work that's not based on seeing the results. And there's a long tradition of people over many different movements over millennia who, have, who give us all this, these gems of wisdom about not knowing what the results are gonna be, but doing it anyway. And so there's, you know, whatever each individual person needs. I mean, this is where the field of philosophy is so interesting. What are the arguments that motivate people? And maybe they're not rational arguments. Maybe they're emotional arguments, right? What are the appeals? What are the persuasive techniques that get people to actually change behavior? And psychologists study this too. But the question of what is going to be the ethical grounds on which I, I act in my life, that's going to be very different for different people, depending on what motivates them. It may change over time. Guilt, like the ecological footprint exercise, asks us to feel guilt, right? When we add up all the amount of carbon that we use and as, you know, and see, at least for myself, that I'm, I need like eight planets or something to keep my lifestyle going or whatever, that kind of thing is intended to result in guilt and individualizing the problem, of course, because it was created by BP. So the, that particular affect or emotion of guilt may make, people have studied this, it changes people's behavior for like three to four weeks. That's not long-term behavior change. Um, different people are motivated for long-term behavior change by lots of different arguments. And we need it all, we need all the arguments. And for me personally, the argument that my individual impact makes no difference, I've just decided that that is irrelevant to me. I don't even care. I personally, for almost a spiritual level, feel, need to feel like I can't possibly go around talking about how important it is to fix the climate if I'm going around in my life doing unnecessary amounts of harm. And so what's it gonna take for me, and I haven't solved this problem, but this is my ongoing journey, what's it gonna take for me to do less harm? And it's, it's having been trained in capitalist society deeply in individualism, deeply in consumerism. You know, I mean, that's that's a that's a journey, and that the motivation to um, act to walk through the world in a way that's not doing harm is something that's more that's motivating to me in a way more, more so than will it make a difference. So everybody needs to find their own access point to that question and and come up with their own reasons for the behaviors that they choose, whether or not something makes a difference in the large, you know, as into a large scale, like enough people are doing it, I don't think should, ma should matter as much as people make it out to. Yeah, and at the same time that kind of the, the responses that we all need to, to take vary from individual to individual, uh, I would imagine that the way that climate anxieties manifest themselves also vary from individual to individual. And so I'm wondering if you have uh, any insights, any thoughts about how climate anxieties manifest differently in different age brackets. I, I feel like we mm -hmm. tend to think about anxieties as something that's really um, pro prominent in younger communities and younger demographics, uh, but I'm sure that it's also something that permeates through all different ages. And so how, what does that look like? What are the nuances uh, and do the strategies yeah. differ for, for how we should address it in those age groups? Well, that's a good question. That second question, I'll have to think about. Um, but the first question about does it differ amongst diff different demographics? And the answer to that is yes, and that's really an interesting part of the story. And I think it really needs more attention. Um, first of all, it differs really prominently ac across age groups. And that's true almost across the, that's almost true globally. So a recent Pew research, um, let me see if I can actually, I might be able to, no, I'm not, I don't have that screen open right now, sorry. Um, I have a, there's a great graphic I sometimes use in my slides that's from Pew Research Institute that shows the this, this spread of climate anxiety among different age groups. And it's like almost every single country they studied, it's like from young to old, it gets, it, it gets lessened. Like there's less and less climate anxiety. You know, the younger you are, the more you have it, and the older you are, the less you have it. Um, except for South Korea and Greece, according to that study, and I won't get into why that is. I don't have any idea, um, but you can puzzle on that if you want. Now, the other demographic factors count too, and of course, there's intersectionality to consider too. Like, what if you are, what if you're some amalgamation of these different identity categories? Do you, you know, is there some algorithm that can tell you how much climate anxiety you feel? Probably not, right? So, but but these factors are really important. So, what's your race? What's your religious affiliation? What's your geography? 
What is your ability or disability? What, relatively speaking to the context you're in, what is your, I mean, all of these things matter, right? All these things count. And that's not because there's something essential about your sexuality that's going to dictate your environmental politics, but because there's all these different elements that play into how the movement is represented, represented who, how it's appealed to different groups, how it's been politicized and all that. So um, it's really complex. It's a complicated story there to tell. And I think lots of people should be out there researching it and trying to tell those stories from different, from different perspectives. I'm thinking here of the brilliant work of one of my colleagues named Jade Sasser, who's at UC Riverside. And she's just done a big study of 2,500 um, young adults in the US context. And her study is, the initial findings of her study suggest that um, women, young women of color are more concerned about climate change than any other, than white people or, or men, and white men in particular. So the race and gender dimension, in, even within the youth category, is a really important story or interesting story to be thinking about why that is and that sort of thing. That said, I'm also thinking about the work of people like Jennifer Uchendo, who's in Nigeria, and I'm thinking of the work of um, activists that are not in the US, that are not US based, or activists who've been doing environmental justice work for a long time, who disavow the term climate anxiety as a privileged term and say that they're experiencing other kinds of emotions. And again, Marianne Hedlar's work on, you know, don't, don't call climate change the greatest existential threat you've had. My climate anxiety is much more nuanced than just about climate. It's about police brutality. It's about the, the legacies of slavery. It's about the legacies of colonialism. And so there's a sense of um, climate being the number one object of concern if that's true, then you must have some privilege because you haven't had a long history of concern threats to your ex your existence in uh, these other structural forms, these other historical forms. So there's some demographic uh, conversation to be had there too about, about the term. I'm very happy that there's so much attention being given right now to climate anxiety because of course, as we see, saw from Don't Look Up, this pickle of how to get people to care about climate has been ongoing now <laughs> for over 30 years, you know? Um, so are we gonna start caring about climate? Sounds like we are, this is great. Uh, however, it has the effect of potentially eclipsing other big problems and to therefore taking resources away from other big problems. Or if people don't see climate as part of a larger structure of colonialism and capitalism, slavery, Long, long traditions of thinking of certain people as disposable and certain resources as um, something we should hold for just certain, for, for other populations, uh, which is the definition of colonialism, then um, we miss an opportunity to see these, these problems as interconnected and structurally connected. Um, so the demographic question around climate anxiety, where does it lead to? It leads to that conclusion for me, which is that we really need to blend really bridge, build the bridges and work hard to do so, despite lots of really long and value, you know, important differences, uh, our justice movements and our climate movement in much more effective ways. Um, that's the conclusion I come to when I look at this research. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good answer. Uh, we have a bunch of audience questions, so I'll just ask one last one before we, we turn to those. Uh, but what do you want the, the main takeaway out of all of this through this whole conversation and through all of your work uh, for our audience to be? Yeah, the main takeaway, I, depending on who the audience is, <laughs> again, to go back to your other the question you just asked, <laughs> right? Depending on the demographic of your audience, I have different takeaways, <laughs> of course. Um, I'm going to assume that your audience is, is youth, okay? And that that's the sort of main category. And within that, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna make assumptions about other demographic qualities. But I do think that there is a, um, a, a sense among young people that, if they don't, or if they're not dedicating themselves 150% to this work, if they're not sort of killing themselves to do this work because it's the work of their lives. And, um, you know, that, that maybe there's this myth that because they're young, they have infinite energy and capacity. There's this like, like this wellspring of fervor and energy and emotional energy that feels like it might as well be tapped for the climate, you know? Um, all of that is awesome. I love seeing that. I mean, it's very inspiring and it is really the antidote to my despair. However, I really do worry about young people um, not protecting their interior resources 
uh, in order to do this stuff for their lives. And I really, so I, I would say, slow down. I'd say the point, the one takeaway is slow down. <laughs> it is urgent, but like Bio Akomalafe says, is a brilliant activist and scholar. Uh, he writes, the times are urgent, we must slow down. And I just, that to me, it really is the take home point. Um, we can't get any of this work done as a collective. Um, and, and, the, and one of the things that I think in movements like Black Lives Matter movement, um, several movements have given some really great insight here, which is if we are not in fact um, practicing the life that we wanna live, the one that we're building for and working on and trying to protect, if we aren't in fact manifesting it right around us at all times as much as possible, at least six days a week, then we've sort of already lost. Like if we're waiting for the utopia to happen after we do all this work, rather than doing everything we can to micro create it, what some people call micro utopias in every little space that we can, even if it's just really ephemeral, really momentary, if we're not constantly practicing that, if we're not constantly protecting that, um, then we sort of already lost. You know, um, this is a real, this is what Adrienne Marie Brown in her beautiful book, Emergent Strategy calls misery resistance. There's a politics to uh, protecting joy. That's very, um, that's uh, a matter of survival. Um, so slow down a bit. It's such an important message to, really slow down and grab joy wherever it presents itself. And I hope that everyone watching today can kind of take that lesson back and think about how we can implement that in their own lives, because it is a really personal journey, like you had just said. Uh, but yeah, I'm just moving to our first audience question. Um, someone wants to know that when we talk about love, do we really need the feeling of love to nature itself to make the change real? In other words, can we look at the problem in a simple way or a more objective way, like a math problem, without any emotions? Uh, hmm. So yeah, that's the question. That is such a good question. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, that's the first time I've ever heard that question. I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna puzzle on that one. That was gonna come up in yeah. my life uh, a lot now. Um, wow, I think it's possible. I think the answer is, yeah, it depends on who you are. You know, um, for some people it might be possible. Um, yeah, and I think to go to the question of, do you have to have love of nature or what E.O. Wilson calls biophilia? Glenn Albrecht has a similar term, solophilia. Um, I think it is possible, very possible, to do climate justice work without having any direct connection to so-called nature. Um, my pathway towards environmental studies actually came through my work in social justice. So I didn't get to environmental studies because I had any particular love of nature or fetishizing of the wilderness or any of that kind of stuff. Um, most of my students come to environmental studies and tell me their journey started because they camped a lot when they were kids or their parents, mom or dad or something took them out fishing all the time or something, right? And I'm like, I didn't, that's not my, that's not my story. I think it's awesome when people have that and I'm happy for them, but I think you can do this work absolutely without it. And similarly, I think, um, you know, in, in the environmental fields, people often feel like you can't make an argument, you can't make any change if you don't have scientific background. And I don't necessarily think that's true. The, the expertise that's required to persuade people to be part of uh, social change is not a scientific question. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of real pushing against the envelope that can happen here around the assumptions that we have. And I wouldn't necessarily even say, I mean, I love Bell Hook's work on love. I'm a big fan of the theory of love. Like I studied agape and love when I was in college and doing my religious studies degree. I, I, I kind of find it an interesting intellectual topic to study. <laughs> that sounds weird, I know. Um, but I don't know if love is necessarily um, the only way in if that's your question. It's definitely not the only way in. When Andy asked the question earlier about, let's look at these other emotions instead of grief and despair, what I, what I think I'd like to preserve out of love there is that um, to think back to Adrian Marie Rao's beautiful quote, feed what you want to grow, which is the title of one of my chapters. Um, it's easy with our negativity bias to focus on how terrible things were doom scrolling all day long. The 24-hour news cycle is telling us all the things from all the corners of the planet that are terrible. 
the thing blowing up in Ghana. I mean, like the, the amount of stuff coming at us, right? Um, it is a fire hose. And we, that the psychological effect of that is to, to make us tired and give up. However, there are things in our lives that, we, that are also true. There's beauty, there's relationship, there's air we're breathing, there's all kinds of stuff that we love. And maybe the love is not the right word, but we rely on, we're in relation with, as Donna Haraway would put it, we're in relation with it. Is there some way to honor that relation? This is also the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer, right? Brady Sweetgrass. Can we honor that, re that relationship? She calls it practical reverence. Maybe that's a preferred term. Practical reverence, right? This world is giving us gifts all the time. Can we give the gifts back? Can we be in reciprocity? I don't know if that requires love. So anyway, to answer your question, that's a, that's a very interesting question. It might require other kinds of emotions, but this is where we could really dial in and get nuanced about emotions. I don't think it's possible to have no emotion about anything we do, because we have, we have to discern on some level what's gonna make us care about one thing instead of another. And that is an emotional question, not a, not a, not a scientific equation. Yeah, really tricky question, but uh, thank you for, for elaborating on <laughs> some of your thoughts. Great question. Actually, even in that last sentence, I'm like, is it po maybe it's possible to think of it as a <laughs> I'm gonna try to get my head around it. <laughs> yeah. No, we have another question about, um, you know, whether you think a large part of the cognitive dissonance and anxiety producing nature of climate change has to do with the fact that we can't really experience it directly, or at least, uh, you know, we can't always feel and smell and, and really perceive what's going on and how the climate is changing in small ways. Uh, so do you have any thoughts you. about that? I love that question. These are really smart questions. Um, thank you. <laughs> love it. I'm talking to my people now. Um, and I'm also gonna move to my power, my power supply since I still rely on the planet to give me that. So hang on. I do appreciate it this electrical coal burning. Actually, this is potentially solar, I don't know. Um, okay, so um, this is a good question. And I think this is one of the places I didn't elaborate on it when you asked the question about Don't Look Up, Andy, um, that that film did a great job. So that film solved a lot of those pickles that this question was raising, right? Like if we cannot perceive climate change by its definition, this has for many years made climate, climate scientists and climate communicators wonder how to, how to, how to frame it, like how to tell the story about climate change. And so you've got people like Rob Nixon writing um, this wonderful book called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, or Amitav Ghosh writing The Great Derangement, Timothy Morton talking about hyper objects. You've got all of these people puzzling over Bruno Latour, you know, writing about the, the Gordian Knot you know, climate change has been an intellectual puzzle for people precisely because it's a, a risk that we cannot perceive. So what, what to do with that information? What do we do with that? And we make films like Don't Look Up, where we turn it into a comic instead, right? So we can tick all the boxes of what people care about to make risk perception happen and then show all the other reasons why people don't care about it. So um, to that point, if it's true, if, do, if Don't Look Up is true, that even if climate change were to tick all the boxes of what we would care to, to worry about, there is this whole other uh, infrastructure of politics and media and, and corporate interests um, that still gets in the way of perception of reality, right? Alternative facts and all that stuff. So, you know, it's not the only problem out there, the perception problem. However, um, if it were the only problem that were out there, it turns out that even if you're perceiving something in your body, you don't necessarily know what it's about because that's the thing about emotions being, the, what I write about in Who Feels Climate Anxiety, the Cairo Review piece, just because you're perceiving climate change doesn't mean that in your head, you're telling yourself the story, I am perceiving climate change. Just like if you're dying of COVID, you know, some people, <laughs> I don't remember if it was Nebraska or what state it was, apologies to Nebraska if I'm wrong here, who were dying of COVID and who didn't, still didn't believe they were dying of COVID, right? I mean, there's this sort of like, you also have to have the story, you have to believe the story that you're telling yourself about what you're experiencing. So if people are experiencing increased threats of wildfires as they are in my state, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, more people now believe climate change is what's happening. 
they still have to have to believe somebody who's telling them the story that those wildfires are caused by climate change. That's a pretty big ask, right? To say to people, believe the hoax, you know, this thing you're experiencing is part of that hoax, if they, if they believe it's a hoax, right? So the perception, you know, it used to be thought that perceiving climate change would make people care about it more, but there's more to, much more to it than that, as it turns out. And I'll stop there because I could go on and on about that. Like, what if your sea level is rising and you're having to leave your house because you live in Shishkarev, you know, or something, you know, it's sort of like, that th there's lots of different ways that these different communities are telling these stories to themselves. So absolutely, if you're in, you know, if, you know, if you're in, um, you know, a low lying nation or you're up in one of those islands in Alaska, you might feel differently because the story you're telling there than if you're in Miami and the same thing has happened, right? The politics around climate change are so different. It's because people are telling different stories about what's happening to them. And we're just about out of time, but uh, with their last minute, I guess, do you have any uh, extra reading, any climate anxiety books that you would recommend for everyone to take away? Uh, <laughs> yeah, my whole library. <laughs> Just, I mean, the amount of stuff that's coming out about this right now is so amazing. Um, Ellen Kelsey's book, Hope Matters, is a fabulous book that's recently come out. Um, we just lost the amazing thinker and activist Thich Nhat Hanh um, a few days ago, and he rape of, you know, only a few months ago, published Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet. Um, there's so much good stuff coming out. Um, there's been good stuff out there too. Britt Ray's just published her book called Gen Dread that you can now order pre-order, um, which is, which specifically kind of brings all this stuff up, up to date. Um, you know, hers is going to be the most recent. It hasn't even been out released yet, but it can be ordered, pre-ordered. Um, yeah, there's so much great stuff out there. I can't even, I mean, I wish I could just take a picture of my line bar. And buy it. Here's what I'm reading right now. My, my nightstand is sort of like overflowing. The amount of pr productivity around this topic is amazing right now. It's yeah. good. We, we need it. <laughs> yeah, those are great places to start. And I just want to thank you so much for a really informative and really interesting and, and extremely important topic. And so I hope everyone watching has been able to, to take something away uh, that they can implement in their own lives I know I, I certainly have. And so, yeah, just a thank you again to Dr. Ray for joining us uh, and for everyone else on uh, the event right now, just keep an eye out for next week's event and for uh, the rest of the term schedule as well. And with that, I'll just bring the event to a close. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.